I know we've talked about Acts 1-8 many a times before, uh, and it happens to be one of my favorite scriptures, and I know you hear me say that a lot about a lot of the scriptures, but it is. It's one of my favorites. It's what led me to being baptized in the Holy Spirit at a Baptist church of all things. And it, Acts 1-8, which is kind of ironic, Acts 1-8 says, But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And it's encouraging to know that. It's encouraging to know that God did not leave us here powerless. It's encouraging to know that when Jesus left, he promised to send another of the same kind. And the way we can look at it, I've heard it explained this way. If I were to offer you an orange and you, and you ate that orange and I asked you, would you like another, what would you expect? An orange, right? You would not expect me to pull out an apple or a banana or anything like that. And that is the exact same context that Jesus gave the disciples when he said, it is expedient that I go away so that I can send another. In other words, another of the same kind, and that is the precious Holy Spirit. We believe in the Trinity. We believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And that's not a New Testament thought. It's all throughout the Bible thought. It's not a, a made-up word. Now, you'll say, well, we can't find the word Trinity in the Bible. You can find the concept all throughout the Bible. You can find in Isaiah, it talks about the Son and the Father and the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. And in the New Testament, we find the Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit, or the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in, uh, when Jesus was baptized. We see the Son, he goes down into the water. When he comes up out of the water, there is a voice from heaven, and it was the Father speaking. So we have two right there. And not only that, but the Holy Spirit descended upon him as a dove, in the likeness of a dove. We have all three parts mentioned there as well. And when Jesus left the earth, he promised to send another of the same kind, in other words, of another of himself, and that is the Holy Spirit. We have been promised the Holy Spirit. He is, as a matter of fact, he's here this morning. He's been here since we started the worship, and, and the Holy Spirit is here. And you can be empowered with the precious Holy Spirit if you'll receive. Amen? He is there. Well, this morning's sermon is called Something's Burning. Something's Burning. And it's not the turkey dinner that we had the other night. Our scripture is from Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 19. Would you please stand with me one more time as we read from the word of the Lord, Revelation 3, 14 through 19. Now, Revelation is the book right before the book of Maps. And so and it says this, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot, I wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Did the Lord say vomit? Yes, he did. Because you say, I am rich, I have become wealthy and had a need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve, so that you may see your salve. And as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Father, I thank you again for your word. And I pray that you would help us to be a church on fire for you, one that glorifies you, that walks in your ways, and, and walks in your paths of righteousness that lead to everlasting life. And Lord, give me the right words to say this morning. May we not be beat down, but rather encouraged to walk in your presence and in your spirit, to walk hand in hand with you. And Jesus name. Amen. You can smile at somebody as you have a seat this morning. There was once a, oh, I'm sure it wasn't just once, but a village atheist. He, a man that never believed in God. He was not interested in church, and he was the only one known atheist in that village. He was it. And there was only one church in the village. It was a cold and dead church. Just a social club with no decisions being made, uh, no growth, just a church for a namesake. Now, one day, that church building caught fire. It's incredible. This thing was on fire, and the whole town ran towards church to help extinguish the flames, including the village atheist. And someone saw the atheist running towards the church and shouted out, Hey, this is nothing new for you. The first time we've ever seen you running to church. And he replied, this is the first time I've ever seen the church on fire. <laughs> My desire is that our church would be a church on fire. Now, not in a literal sense, so you pyromaniacs, uh-uh. 
but in the sense, a spiritual sense, to be one that is on fire with the, the power of the Holy Spirit. And we've been praying for revival at this church for a number of years, and I will continue to pray for revival and, and pray that God uh, meets that out for us until that day comes, and I'm looking forward to the day when this church just really gets going. Amen? My desire is that Sumter will see First Assembly burning and that they will come to hear what it is that's going on, taking place at Revival. And this morning, we're going to see or look at characteristics of a people and a church that is on fire for the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Spirit. You see, it's easy for a people to lose their fire in God. You know that fire takes, it takes effort to, to keep a fire going. R Royal Rangers know this. It takes effort to get a fire started for, for, for first place because there's preparation that takes place. There is preparation that takes place as believers in order for revival fire to come. We cannot become complacent in our walk with the Lord God. We have to be men and women after God's own heart. I'm going to tell you something. Revival's not going to come if we aren't praying for it. Revival's not going to come if we don't prepare for revival. And the reason being is because with a fire, you have to prepare. You can wish all you want to be warm. But if you don't go out and get the, the kindling that you need, if you don't go out and get some of the, what is it, peat moss, tinder, if you don't get the tinder made, and if you don't make a bird's nest just right, and I'm not talking about stealing a bird's nest, but making a bird's nest, unless if you really want those eggs that bad. But you get that, that little bird's nest going, and you have your, your char cloth ready, and you've got your stick set off to the side, and you know that that wood has to be dry and not wet, and you've got to get it all ready for that moment when that first spark hits the char cloth. And then you've got to add a little bit of wind and listen, if we're not prepared for revival, if we aren't praying for revival, if we're not fasting for revival, it's not going to come. I want to encourage us this morning. This isn't a beat down on what we're not doing, but rather I want to encourage us. Maybe it's time for us to start turning up the heat to get revival going, to stir ourselves up in the Holy Spirit and to get the wood ready because revival fire is on the way. I said revival fire is on the way, church. And it's going to be a matter of us. Are we ready for fire? Are we ready for the Lord to start working in us in a mighty way? I am. How about you? I'm ready for the fire to come. I'm ready for his precious Holy Spirit to ignite this place with his passions and his desires to see the lost come to Jesus Christ. And, you know, when fire comes in, it refines that which is there. When fire comes in, it will refine that which is there. It's going to burn away the chaff and the stubble, and it's going to refine the precious metals and the gems that are there. Are you ready? I'm ready. It's easy for people to lose their fire in God. And their fire is usually lost when we start concentrating on ourselves and our own problems and our needs rather than looking to God. You see, at that point, then church kind of becomes a convenience type thing. People come in late. They're not concerned about church other than Sunday. There's no discipline for fasting or prayer. There's, it just kind of becomes a thing of the past. That's what we used to do, but not now. What's worse is that believers lose their enthusiasm and love for God. And I think just as equally bad as we lose our love for one another. And that's where strife comes in and gossip, backbiting, bitterness, anger. Things that are not becoming of believers. In the Bible, Jesus calls such believers lukewarm believers. They're neither hot nor cold. Now, I don't know about you, but when it comes to something to drink, I either like my drinks hot or cold, one or the other. When they're hot, especially in the, in the wintertime, hot cocoa. But if you leave that cocoa out and it gets lukewarm, it's good for nothing but the trash or to be dumped down the sink. Or an ice-cold water in the summertime, you know, when you're outside and you're drinking that ice-cold water, but if you leave it out on the porch somewhere and a little while later you come back and that thing's lukewarm, it'll make you nauseous. It's no bueno. We need to be hot or cold. Lukewarm believers are neither that. They're neither hot nor cold. And when this happens... To them, it seems like the worship leader and choir just going through the songs, or if we've got a choir, or the, the worship people, people sing for the sake of singing instead. The Sunday school teachers, ushers, leaders lose the fire. They just go through the motion of Sunday morning. If you've ever attended a church like that, you know what I'm talking about. 
And unfortunately, those types push God out. But everything inside is godly is what they're saying. Everything else inside is godly. And if any of us have gotten into such a habit where our zeal is gone and our faith in Jesus Christ is just a matter of coming to church on Sunday mornings, then I have a warning from God for you. And let's look again at Revelation 3, 15 through 17. Jesus said, I know your deeds that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. Now, I want you to understand here before we read the rest of this passage, Jesus is not saying that he wants you to be cold as cold and indifferent towards him. He's not saying he would rather you be a heathen and living for, for the devil. But rather, you need to understand where these people were at. There were two types of water sources coming to them. One was from the mountains, which was cold water. One was from hot springs, which was hot water. But by the time they got to their city, they were lukewarm. And the cold waters are used to refresh the hot waters are used for medicinal purposes, for medicine, for, for healing. So God either wants us to be cold and refreshing or hot with healing, but nothing in between. He's not asking you to be a heathen. He's asking you to be cold as in to be a refreshing person to the world. Continuing on. So because you're neither, or because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. You say, I'm rich, I've acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. You see, Jesus is calling the believers who have lost their enthusiasm, he's calling them lukewarm. The dictionary says lukewarm is a lack of feeling or enthusiasm. And some Christians have become like this. They've lost their enthusiasm and love for God. They come to worship and just go back home. That's it. I've gone and done my duty. That's it. The presence of God does not matter to them, and loving people is the last thing on their minds because they just tolerate them when they come to church. And this attitude is very dangerous. And see what Jesus says to this church. He says, I will vomit you out of my mouth. I'm not one of those cool people that vomits quietly. <laughs> I'm not. When I go, I mean, I'm, it's all out war in there, and, and it just... I'm one of those projectile vomiters. Some of you may be like that. Others of you are just cool about it, like whatever, not me. But I hate it. I hate doing that with all. I would rather be sick to my stomach at times than, than do that. But the, the visual image we get here is Christ doesn't like lukewarm people. He's not going to keep them inside. He's going to out, right? And I see them as projectile out. Did you really have to tell us all that, Pastor Jason? Probably not, but now you know. How does lukewarm water taste to you? It, it's wet, okay, but how does it taste? And it's not good at all. If you mix freezing ice water and boiling hot water and drink it, you'll feel nauseous and want to spit them out. And this is the same feeling God has towards those believers who have lost their passion. And Jesus is telling us that if we're not passionate about him, it makes him nauseous and he'll spit us out of his mouth. Lukewarm believers were once zealous for God. And now they have good salaries, they've got new spouses, good businesses, and all which, by the way, God gave. And they have forgotten God. No time for God, they're running after their own affairs, and they feel very rich. However, Revelation 3.17 says, You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, poor, pitiful, blind, and naked. And if you've lost your zeal for God, you may be listening today online, or here in this room, if you've lost your zeal for God, you're poor in the sight of God, and the fire of God is out of your life. Where is your fire? Where is your zeal and your first love? In Genesis 22, we find an account of Abraham and Isaac. Can you remember these from, from the, reading you through your Bible? Abraham is going up to the mountain to make a sacrifice. He's taking his son with him because God has asked Abraham to do what? Sacrifice his son, Right? This is his son that God had promised him that would be the heir that all the nations would be blessed through. And Abraham didn't hesitate. He started heading towards the mountain. Abraham and Isaac arrived at the location, and Isaac still did not realize that he was going to be the sacrifice. Isaac knew there, there needed to be three things for a sacrifice. There needed to be wood, fire, and a lamb. Genesis 22, 7, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? 
You see, in Abraham's life, there was a fire and wood, but there was no lamb. But you know the rest of the story. God provided the lamb. Now, if we look at most Christians around us, we can invert the question and ask, we have the wood, the cross of Calvary. We have the lamb, Jesus Christ, the lamb of God. But where is the fire? Where's the Holy Spirit? Where is the zeal? It's missing. You can even look at one another and say, hey, are you on fire? If you don't want to, that's fine, too. I do want to do this, though, and most of you are aware of this next thing that we're going to do. When I say you need to get fired up, I want you to reply, we are fired up, okay? So when I say you need to get fired up, up. there you go. So that way when you hear you need to get fired up, all right, so you guys are on, on track there. We need to get the fire back, don't we? What are the characteristics of a church or people on fire for God? Well, we're going to go to Acts and see the example that has been set for, uh, for on-fire people and an on-fire church. An on-fire church, Acts 4, 31 through 33, says this. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled. I want you to note that word all right there. I looked it up, and I cross-referenced it and made sure, but all, it means all. So there you go. They were all filled, not some of them, not just the ones that people said, well, maybe that's just for you and not for me. No, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. All believers were in one mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had with great power. The apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. Did you hear that this morning? With great power, they testified to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. We took communion this morning. We are testifying to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. We are also testifying to the fact that one day soon, Jesus Christ is coming back again. One day soon, he is coming back in the clouds of glory. One day soon, we will meet him in the air. Are you ready? Hallelujah. So our first thing this morning, a church on fire prays, especially if it's really on fire. A church on fire is a praying church. A believer that's on fire is a believer that prays. Prayer needs to be a continuous aspect of the church and God's people. And I'm not just talking about praying with your understanding, but also praying in the Spirit. Praying with the, in, in the Holy Spirit and then asking for the interpretation so that you can continue to pray. You know, it's one thing that you can pray out loud with your understanding, but I'll, let's be honest, there are times you just hit a wall. What am I supposed to pray for next? That's where we kick over into praying in the Spirit. And as we pray in the Spirit, we can ask for understanding what we're praying about. And the Lord will give it to us because if you, you have not because you ask not. But if you ask, you can receive. And when we receive those things, then we can continue on in our understanding. And then when we hit that wall again, we go back into the Spirit, back and forth. And you can continue to pray like that for a very long time. But a church that's on fire prays. Prayer brings the fire. The New Testament church and the people always prayed. In Acts 1.14, they all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women. Acts 2.42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Acts 4.31, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. Oh, that would be awesome. Acts 7.59, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed. Wow. I mean, they're killing the guy, and he's still praying. Acts 12, 5, so Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. What was the church doing? Praying. Acts 12, 12, when this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Are you seeing a pattern here? In Acts 16, 25, about midnight, I love this account. Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And you know that, that account there. And then the, the jailhouse was shaken and everybody's bonds fell off. And the jailer got saved and his whole family as well. So we see that prayer is an important part. It was started, it, it was, it's an important part of our church as well because we're living in New Testament times. Amen? The New Testament church prayed and they prayed and they prayed and they prayed. And what happened when they prayed? 
Well, it brought deliverance. It brought joy and fellowship. It brought unity. And most importantly, prayer brings the fire. Acts 2, 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. <clears throat> Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Isn't that awesome? This still happens today, by the way. People are filled with the Spirit at the evidence of speaking in tongues. Charles Finney, great revivalist of the 1700s, told about a church in a certain town, a church where the fire had gone totally out. No one saved, and even worse, no one cared. There was no zeal, no enthusiasm, and the pastor, too, did not care for the situation. But there was a blacksmith in town. He stammered when he spoke. It was painful to hear him speak. He had a heart for God and wanted revival fire again. He was so burdened for the fire that one day he chose to close the doors of his shop, and he went home and prayed for the rest of the day. The next day, he approached the pastor and said, Pastor, I've been praying for revival, for God to rekindle the flames around here. Can we schedule some kind of meeting, some kind of revival? The pastor agreed with a warning that no one's going to come. Now, there's faith for you. With faith like that, you might as well close the doors, right? No one's going to come. They had the meeting, and to the pastor's surprise, the building was full. He stood up to preach as always, but he felt very different. The power of God was so strong in that place that everyone could feel it. Dozens of people were saved that week. The fire was reignited. Why? Because someone chose to pray. Someone chose to sacrifice their time and their food and, and to, to get in before the presence of God. They were tired of the status quo. Are you are ready for a change? Are you ready for the fire? What are we going to do about it? It's time to start praying. You see, it wasn't methods or programs, activities or organizations. It was because somebody prayed that the fire came. Where people pray, God sends the fire. The next point this morning is a church on fire is endued with power. You can see the fire of the Holy Spirit the way the church worships. The worship leader's attitude to worship and the pastor's attitude to preach. And first of all, when a church is on fire, if the, it's in the pastor and the leaders have been on fire first. And we find this in Acts 4.8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, and he continues on, it's the leader, he's, he's filled with the fire. Then the people have to be on fire. Listen, this isn't just a, a leaders-only type club here. This is that everybody's included in this process. The people have to be on fire, Acts 4.31. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. You see, we cannot depend on man-made excitement to get the power of God. Did you hear that? We can't depend upon man-made excitement to get the power of God. For, for many of us, our worship stops when the keyboard shuts down and the drummer comes down. That's not the way it's supposed to be. None of these things, the, the, all, these things are great, but none of these things can substitute for the power of the Holy Spirit upon a church. And what happens when a pastor and people are praying and endued with power? Well, you're going to find that souls get saved. And, and by this time in Acts chapter 4, we've seen it's probably about 8,000 people that have been saved by now. That, my friends, is revival. These are people that were turning their world upside down. Are you ready to start turning Sumter upside down? Mm-hmm. Me too. When we get that power, worship services will be inspiring and the music will be uplifting. I'm going to ask you something, church. Do you want life in our praise and worship? I'm going to tell you how you can find life in our praise and worship. I'm going to tell you how you can find life in praise and worship no matter what church you attend. Are you ready for this? Be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's how you can find life in any praise and worship. Listen, there have been times where I was disgruntled and Satan was just having a heyday with me, and I was letting him do it because I wasn't using my brain at the time, and I got through a worship service, and I thought, huh, there's nothing here. But yet that same service, my wife was like, that was awesome. Why? What's the difference? One chose to be led by the Holy Spirit, and the other one was being led by the flesh. And if y'all are honest, we've probably all sat in that boat at one time or another. 
But the truth is, when you come to this place, it's not the worship team. It's the people that are involved that depends on whether or not it's going to be a good worship service. Amen? It's when we get filled with the Holy Spirit and allow Him to move through us and in us that we can start seeing some awesome worship services. Amen? All glory. To be filled with the Spirit. We can have the best musicians and the best equipment, but until you pray and are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, it will just be a Sunday band or a Sunday musical morning. Missions happen in a church that's endued with power. And I know this church is heavily involved in missions, and I'm proud of you guys for that. Wow, you guys do a lot. And I'm thankful for what you do and the sacrifices you make. A church that's on fire with the passion of the Holy Spirit and get God has God's heart will be involved in missions as you are. A revived church will never collect money aggressively, but the church will give money for missions and missionaries. We find this in Acts 13, verses 2 and 3. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Another thing that a church on fire does, a church on fire walks in unity. A church on fire has unity in it. They all become one, Acts 4.24. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God, Acts 4.32. All the believers were in one heart and mind. Listen, this is a church on fire for God. We have a common goal we're, we're looking for, and we all must join hands in equality and unity. There's no magnifying oneself. All are important. The one that needs to be magnified the most, though, or the one that should be magnified is God, and he is recognized and magnified in this place. And that doesn't mean that our importance is minimized. When there's no special consideration or when there's so many people active in the church, some try to minimize their importance, and they say, well, you know, nobody's going to miss me, so I don't need to show up. There's something for you to do. There's something for every person in the church to do. I heard Pastor Ron McManus say this. He said, you know, the, the average is 20% of the church is doing 80% of the work. And you need to understand that the church is a body. It's a functioning body. So to put that in perspective, right now the way it is according to statistics, we've got one hand and one foot going 90 miles an hour trying to get everything done. The rest of the body is paralyzed. Why? Because people are not stepping up to do what God has called them to do within the church. Oh, that'll preach. You still love me? Okay. Church, and I'm going to say this for even for our church. There's so much more we could get done if every person would get involved. And if you're thinking there, well, you haven't asked me to do something. Okay. I'm asking you now, will you do something? Please. Why didn't you come to me individually? Listen, I, if you've got something that God has laid upon your heart, and that doesn't mean we're going to start a ministry for everything out here, but there's plenty of things that we can do right now. I'm not going to meddle in that any longer. Thank you, Pastor. Church on Fire, next point, Church on Fire evangelizes. When a church is on, in, in, on fire, evangelism is a priority. And many of you are excellent in evangelism. You've been through the courses, and I hear your stories of things that you're doing, and I'm proud of you for that. It's very evident that you're bringing people to church, and you're witnessing on your job, neighborhood, and everything. And it's God who gives the growth through your contacts. And this is exactly what happens when a church is on fire. It's about evangelism and growth. R.G. Lee said this. I'm going to quote him. He said, God never intended the church to be a refrigerator in which to preserve pi perishable piety. He intended it to be an incubator in which to hatch our converts. Hallelujah. First assembly is open for sinners to come and repent, and for that we need to be on fire for God. Listen, conversions are messy because people are messy. People are in all kinds of different things, and as they come out of those, we're going to have to minister to them and have a way to minister to them and love on them. They don't know how to act in church. They may come running down the hallway. 
Instead of getting mad at them, we just take them aside and, and show them and love on them. And as this year is ending, listen, I want to I want to make a decision for all of us, or no, not for all of us, for myself. And I would like for you to join me. How, how about let's make a decision to talk about God to, to our, at least five families and invite them to church and follow up with them and, and get them rooted and grounded in the church. So how is our, our condition today? Are we zealous for God or have we lost our first love? Are we on fire for God or are we lukewarm? I hope you're not lukewarm, but if you are, there's good news because God's got a microwave. He can take care of that. He's got a freezer. He can take care of that. He can make you hot or cold if you're willing to let him work through you. He can make you one that's refreshing or one that's a medical person to help heal. I want to conclude by going back to the lukewarm church that we, that we started with, the church of Laodicea in Revelation 3. Jesus is telling them that physically and financially God has blessed them and they have accumulated wealth, but spiritually God sees them as poor. And it may be the same for some of us. God has blessed us so much, but spiritually we're becoming poor, wretched, blind, and naked. In other words, we've become lukewarm, no zeal, and no enthusiasm. See what Jesus is telling to the spiritually poor people, though. Revelation 4.18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and wear clothes and white, the, the, and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. You see, God is telling them that they are indeed poor. And how can a poor man buy gold and clothes and, and, and salve for his eyes? How can he do these things? How can you buy gold when you're broke? Spiritually, they are broke, but how then can they buy? Jesus said, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. When the fire comes spiritually, you become rich and everything else is available. Have the fire in you. So how do we get the fire? Revelation 4.20. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. We normally associate this verse with unbelievers, but we need to realize is that it's actually spoken to the church. And you've seen the paintings before. Jesus is standing at the door. He's knocking. There's no doorknob on the door because the door can only be opened from the inside. That verse is addressed to the lukewarm Christians who has lost the, lost the fire. It's addressed to church goers who have lost their enthusiasm for God. So how do we get the fire? Invite him in. He's knocking at the door. We pray. Verse 20 shows prayer. I will come in and eat with him and he with me. When we pray with Jesus, when we pray with the Father, we are sitting down to dine with him. We are fellowshipping with him. God is telling us if we pray, he will come in and have fellowship and communion, communion with us, and he will rekindle the fire in us. And one more thing is to repent. How do we get the fire? Not only do we pray, but we also have to repent and to follow after God with our all. As the praise team comes this morning, I want to finish with this illustration. Some of you are familiar with the name D.L. Moody. One day while on vacation, D.L. Moody was visiting a large but dead church in London. And the pastor prevailed upon him to preach there in all the services. Now, he didn't want to, but Moody agreed to anyway. He preached and later said that they were so unresponsive, it was all he could do to get through the morning message. That's rough right there. Then it occurred to him that he'd have to endure the same thing that night when he's supposed to be on vacation. He dreaded it all afternoon, but behind the scenes, something was going on. An elderly woman that morning went home to her invalid sister and told her about Moody being there. Her eyes lit up, for she had been praying that God would send Moody to England. Put lunch away. We'll spend the rest of the afternoon in prayer and fasting, she said, and that they did. Moody said that he stood up that night before the people, and he could tell something was different. It was alive with the electricity of the power of God. You could feel it in the air. He preached and gave the invitation to rise if they wanted to be saved and restored. And 500 people stood to their feet. He was shocked. He thought maybe they had misunderstood. Be seated, he said. Now I'm, gonna, I'm saying, stand up if, and he went through the whole process in more detail 
And again, 500 people stood up. It was the beginning of what became one of the greatest revivals that ever swept England. Why? Because two old ladies, one was bedridden, decided to pray and fast for a service. God can work just through one person. He can work through two people. Can you imagine what can happen in this church right here if we choose to do the same? Oh, glory. Sumter would be turned upside down shortly, wouldn't it? When many of the city churches are losing its flame, it's my desire that our church will be a church on fire. And everyone who walks into this place will be set on fire by the Holy Spirit. That they will be baptized in the Holy Spirit, saved, and, and get baptized in water as well. Would you please stand with me this morning? Church, it's time for the fire to be kindled in this place. It's time for us to seek the Lord. As we open the altars this morning, I want to encourage you to seek the Lord. Maybe you've been lukewarm, and you know, at least now's the time to repent. Amen? Maybe you are on fire. Would you come too and just pray and ask God to stir this place up? Whatever your case is, the altars are open this morning. If you want to rededicate your life to Christ, please do so. Or if you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life, I'll be up here. I'd love to pray with you. Whatever it is, would you come? They that wait upon the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord. go before the Lord one more time this morning. Father, we thank you again for your word. And God, I thank you for a church that's on fire for you, for missions, for evangelism. And I'm asking that you would stir us up even more. May this become a place where people even drive by, they know that your spirit is here. 
I pray for those that need baptized in the Holy Spirit, that you would anoint them right now, that they would receive your precious Holy Spirit and begin to speak in tongues as you give them utterance. And they may be listening online, and I'm just asking right now that that would be done in Jesus' name. Baptize them now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. It is done. Lord, for those that need a healing touch for mom and others as well, that you would anoint them with your power. And we're believing you that you're anointing them right now from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet. We call them healed in Jesus' name. And, Lord, I thank you for stirring us up as well in your precious Holy Spirit. We love you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, I love you. By the way, you need to get fired up. <laughs> we'll see you tonight in here at 6 o'clock for a service for everybody.